shout it out. We're alive, cause you're alive, and what a love we found. Death can't hold us down. We shout it out. We're alive, cause you're alive. Turn if you would this morning to the book of 1 Samuel, chapter number 17. You're familiar with the story. Um, what's in that chapter of David and Goliath, one of the, uh, perhaps one of the most preached portions of scripture that there is. But uh, I want to preach today, it'd be a little bit different, a little bit out of the norm for me, but I, I just really felt led to go this direction today. I, I want to preach about your life, your life and mine. I'm not going to leave myself out today, but here's the title for any of you uh, sports fans. Here's the title for you today. I predict an upset. I predict an upset victory in your life. How many people know about sports and upsets and things like that? That's what I'm predicting for folks that are going through things and the enemy may be saying, look, things are real bad or whatever. I'm predicting an upset. For many or most of us in the room today and uh, watching by internet, I know that uh, so many of us are familiar and remember the uh, many of the great rivalries in sports. And I, I love watching great rivalries so long as I win, of course. I love watching great rivalries uh, but for me, it's generally basketball. I go all the way back to my high school days. I absolutely love basketball. And so basketball has been my thing, uh, whether it was, you know, after I became an adult, I would watch college sports and especially, again, basketball and, and uh, then even professional sports. But I, I really, that was my favorite, I suppose. And I, I recall certain people uh, who just really seemed to have it all together. Uh, one of those guys was a fellow by the name of Julius Irving. They called him Dr. J. How many of you know who Dr. J is? And, and uh, Dr. J, he was phenomenal. It was almost like, you know, this guy's almost like he had glue on his hands when he would grab a hold of a basketball. I mean, and I, I still remember one time in particular where it seemed like he left about the free throw line and just flew through the air and slammed it down. But if you notice the picture behind me also, you see another guy that we'll talk about in a minute, uh, Larry Bird. I'm going to tell you, this white guy could jump. <laughs> I mean, do you all agree with me on that? I mean, uh, Danny Ainge, he's just like, you know, like, wow, that's way up there. But then there was another fella that you all all remember uh, by the name of Magic Johnson. Uh, this guy, he could shoot, he could steal, he could pass. I mean, he was sort of one of those complete packages, if you will. Then there was a, another guy who wasn't very well known by the name of Michael Jordan. And uh, it was, are you a big fan, Guta? Yeah. And uh, Michael Jordan, I mean, that guy, he, he was absolutely something else. He could fly through the air. He was intelligent with a basketball. I, I had a pair when, I think right at probably my senior year, I can't remember exactly when I got them, but I had a pair of Air Jordan basketball shoes. <laughs> and I will admit to you today that uh, I was proud. I was proud because I had Air Jordan shoes, but uh, quite a player. Then, then the other guy that I mentioned a while ago, we'll throw his picture up on the screen today also, Larry Bird. I, I mean... This guy, he was something else. Uh, the things he could do with a basketball, it was like it was like he was almost a genius and his mind would go ahead of him uh, to such a degree and he was so quick and he was athletic for, uh, especially I suppose for a white guy, he was incredibly athletic. But here again, he, he was just a genius with a basketball. I, I have to tell you, I'm a little bit bitter toward him today, still after all these years, because as I recall, uh, it was in 1979 that he caused the Razorbacks to get beat out of the Final Four. And uh, am I right on that date? Somebody help me out. And uh, no, I'm really not bitter after. I think Larry Bird is a, just a 
phenomenal player. But, but then you had the teams, you had their teams, you had the 76ers, you had the Lakers, you had the Chicago Bulls and the Boston Celtics. And, and uh, there were many times that uh, we would say things uh, when they were about to play like, well, I predict the Bulls are going to win or I predict the Lakers are going to win and, or somebody might say, well, my money's on the Bulls or something of, to that effect. But then there were times that, and I suppose this could go to college, this could go uh, to professional sports, whatever, but there are also times when we would say that, you know, I, I realize that their team is better than my team but I'm predicting an upset today. You know, sometimes you just felt like, am I the only one here that you just felt like, even though they had a really good team, you felt like your team was going to win. Am I talking to anybody today? You know what I'm talking about. And so we just felt that way. We felt like there was going to be an upset. And so that was exciting to me because, you know, then you're really watching and you're thinking this is really going to happen. And sometimes it did and sometimes it didn't. But when it comes to God, and it, when it comes to your life as a Christian, as a believer, it's not, about, it's not all about your goodness. It's not all about your talent or what things may look like. It's about a battle that has already been won at Calvary as Jesus defeated death, hell, and the grave forever. Amen? So when it comes to your life as a believer, no matter what you're facing today, no matter what you're going through, what battle, what struggle, what heartache, what failure, what struggle, whatever it is. It may look like the odds are against you, but I've come to tell you today that I am predicting a victory in your life. Would you give Jesus praise today in this place? Let's go to 1 Samuel chapter number 17. Here again, familiar story to us, the story of David and Goliath. Here again, preached a lot, talked about a lot, and, and uh, even we hear about it even in... Uh, commentators on television, but let me set the scene just a little bit. So, of course, you had King Saul with all the men of Israel on one side, and you had the Philistines and their army on the other side, and then you had this valley in between. So, so today, y'all can be the army of Israel over here, and y'all can be the Philistines over here. Now, y'all might not like that idea. Verse number 4, Scripture says, 1 Samuel chapter 17, says that a champion went out from the camp of the Philistines named Goliath. And Scripture says very clearly that he was from Gath. Now, I won't go into it deeply today, but you know that David had, he ended up having five smooth stones. You'll also uh, possibly remember that there were five Philistine cities that all had a giant with them. It just so happened that the one from Gath, his name was Goliath. And scripture says here in verse number four that his height was six cubits in a span, so that's about nine and a half feet tall. I mean, he was a big fella. He had a bronze helmet on his head, verse five, and he was armed with a coat of mail and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. That is around, I believe, 126 pounds. And he had bronze armor on his legs and a bronze javelin between his shoulders. I mean, this dude, he was covered up with stuff. Now, the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his iron spearhead weighed 600 shekels, which is about, if you can picture his spearhead, just the spearhead, that's about 15 or 16 pounds. So, I mean, can you imagine trying to throw, Mark Roth, 15 or 16 pounds? Just the spearhead weighed that much. It says, and a shield bearer went before him. Now, regularly, Goliath would holler out to the armies of Israel. He would go out and he would make a scene. He would holler out to the armies of Israel to send somebody out to fight. Send somebody out to meet him and to fight him. Now, I've got a question for you today. Who in their right mind would walk out there and fight that dude? Who in their right mind? I, I'm just thinking, you know, Cooter Davenport from the Dukes of Hazard. How many of you know Cooter Davenport? Cooter Davenport from the Dukes of Hazard. he said, he would always say, I may be crazy, but I ain't dumb. 
I may be crazy, but I ain't done. Goliath may have not been the sharpest knife in the drawer, but this guy was big. This guy was really, really big, and he was strong as an ox, or maybe three. But I'm reminded of a, of a scripture, though, that says in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter number 10, verse number 4, it says, speaking of us today as believers, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds. Now watch this in the next verse. Casting down arguments in every nine foot six thing, every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Now I want you to pay particular attention to this next verse though. Verse number six. It says, and being ready to punish. In other words, it said, being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Now, verse number six seems to show to me a post-victory action. I, I just think maybe the Holy Spirit dropped something into my, my heart and my spirit about a post-victory action kind of thing. Just because you have had a good day or just because you've had a good week or something victorious happens happened to you this past week, that doesn't mean we get comfortable. That doesn't mean we just go sit on the couch and, and uh, just have a good old time and relax. When your faith is strong, that is the best time that I know of to continue being a conqueror for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Can I get a witness today in this place? Amen. I think, I'm not positive about this, but I think it was Alpha Alpha. And maybe Spanky or one of them were holding uh, Alpha Alpha back like this and holding him on his head like this. But, but Alpha Alpha said, let me at him, let me at him. Am I right? Was that Alpha Alpha? Other people have done that, I know. But... Uh, when you and I are in a, whether we're on a mountaintop or whether we're in a valley, the, either one of them, that's a time when we ought to say, well, let me at them, let me at them. There is a battle that has to be fought. Let me get out there on the front lines and see the glory of God come down and see God get the victory. Somebody give God praise in this place today. We know later, and we're not, we can't cover all of this today. I'm going to pick up on it again next week. We know later that David picked up uh, five smooth stones, as I said a while ago, and, and he slings a rock at mighty Goliath, and he hits him in the head. He knocks him to the ground. Goliath falls forward, we know from Scripture, and he lands on his face. I will tell you today that I really hope it busted his nose. But I don't know for sure about that. But Goliath does. He falls down. He falls on his face. He falls forward. And, and uh, the blow from the stone mortally wounded Goliath. But he's apparently still breathing. Not sure exactly how that played out. But uh, we do know that David then goes over, takes Goliath's sword, and he finishes him off. And then he chops his head off. Now, I know that doesn't sound very politically correct today. I, I, I get all that. But something to consider today. When you turn your life over to God, that is not a stopping point. That is not just a final destination for you. Amen? There's going to be more to do. There are going to be more battles to face. Amen? But when you surrender your life to God, you have just begun a brand new life with the God of heaven on your side. Therefore, no matter what battle you face, you cannot lose. Would somebody give God praise in here this morning? I want to share with you a few things today, though, that David faced. And I've never heard this preached, and I, I just began to go through this, and I was looking at this story, and, and some of these things just seem to unravel in my mind, and I'm going to share them with you today. I'm going to share them fairly quickly with you, and everybody say a good amen right there. Amen. Those of you that like to write, pull out a crayon and write these down if you would. First of all, these are things that, again, David had to face. David had to overcome his own physical limitations. He was just a kid. I mean, he's just a kid. He's just a young fella. Uh, but he had to overcome his own physical limitations. Now, 
Let me ask you a question today. When you look in the mirror, what do you see? Do you see a winner or do you see a loser? Think about that this morning. What do you see? When I look in my inner mirror, if I can put it that way today, when I look at myself in my mirror, I can pick out a whole lot of physical limitations, but I will tell you for a fact today that every time I look in my own inner mirror, even though I will see physical limitations, I still see a winner through Jesus Christ. Can you give him praise again this morning? Amen. Number two, David had to overcome everyone else's fear. You realize in life, there are people, not everybody around you is going to operate in faith. David had to overcome everyone else's fear. There are times when it seems like everybody around you is giving up. It seems like at times that some of your best friends are quitting. I know, I, I get that. But when those times come and somebody else is giving up, that is the time for you as a believer in Jesus Christ to rise up. Amen? Amen. Saul and all of his men were scared to death. They were literally scared to death. We can't go into all of it today. You can read later in verse number 11. But they were so scared. And David had to overcome that. When you're surrounded by all this stuff, and it happens to, sometimes today with people on their jobs and whatever, they're surrounded with negativity, and they're, they're surrounded with backbiting, they're surrounded with... Am I just preaching to myself today? No. no. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Number three. David had to overcome the perception of others. How others viewed him. For some, David was only good for taking snacks out to the older brothers and tending the sheep. You know, for some, their perception was that David, the only thing he was good for was, you know, going around doing the chores and stuff like that. And, and uh, cheese and crackers, anybody? Cheese and crackers! You know, that was the only thing that he was good for. That was their perception. And sometimes, if we're not really careful in our lives, somebody else's perception gets into our spirit and messes us up. But I will tell you, you can overcome everybody else's perception because you are a child of God. Amen? And I will tell you for a fact today, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, God has His plans that are strapped to your feet. And again, as I said a while ago, you cannot lose. Amen. Amen. Number four is this. David had to overcome intimidation. You ever been intimidated by somebody who maybe was better at a job or somebody who was perceived to be better looking or something like that? Life can be very, very intimidating sometimes. Big bills, big problems. I want you to think about Goliath. Goliath was a monster of a man. He was a huge man. I mean, if you think about it and you think about how big he was, I don't know how much he weighed, but, but if he's nine and a half feet tall, somewhere in that, he may have been taller than that even. If he was more than that, whatever his weight was, it had to be a bunch. And if he just stepped on you, he would bust you up. That sounds like something Muhammad Ali would say. But he would bust you up. I'm telling you, he's a big guy. Life can be so intimidating at times. You say, well, I'm not intimidated by, any, by anything. Well, I will tell you, I'm happy for you because there are a lot of people out in this world today that are intimidated by the stuff going on around them. Amen? Amen? Amen. Number five, David had to overcome the lack of faith found in other people. Are you going to be a winner or are you going to be a loser? Are you going to be a leader or are you going to follow the crowd? I, I want to read here in verse number 20 of this chapter. I want to read this to you. While we're talking about overcoming the lack of faith found in others, I want you to see something here. It says that David rose early in the morning, left the sheep with a keeper, and took the things and went as Jesse had commanded him. And he came to the camp as the same time. He came to the camp the same time as the army was going out to fight. And scripture says here in the end of this verse that they were shouting for the battle. They were shouting for the battle. I don't know if you've ever noticed this, but Saul's army 
looked the part. They even knew what they were supposed to sound like when they went out to fight. I've seen a lot of people in life and a lot of people in churches even, and a lot of people outside of churches per se who still consider themselves a part of the church who they have a shout as well as people inside the church can have a shout with no faith and no anointing and no wisdom. Are y'all with me today? They're just following the crowd. Anybody can learn how to holler. Amen? As, as a matter of fact, I've even seen people who could shout inside the church house and then cuss on the way home from church. Shouts are drowning me out this morning. That preach right there. I'm not President Trump, but if that was him, he'd probably say, that's tweetable. <laughs> Listen, people will disappoint you. They will. But don't compare and don't base your faith on the faith of others. Don't do it. Look to God. I don't, I don't care if it's your best friend. It doesn't matter who it is. Don't base your faith on somebody else. Now, I want you to watch what happens here in verse number 23. David sees what's going on, and he runs over to the army and to his brothers. And Scripture says there in verse number 23 that he began to talk to them. As he talked to them. Now, I just got to picture David for just a minute, and, and I've got to picture what was this guy thinking? I mean, he's he's a young fellow, but it's exciting. He's he's there. I, I've arrived. I'm I'm at the battle. I I with well, I'm with my brothers. I'm with the army of Israel. What? Well, sorry, y'all feel sick. I'm with the army of Israel. I mean, this must have been. So exciting. Now maybe he was heading out, handing out some cheddar cheese or pepper jack. I don't know what he was doing with all that, but, but I can tell you, I think he was very excited to be there. But scripture says there that as he talked with them, there was the champion. I mean, all of a sudden, Goliath walks up, he shows up. As he talked with them, there was the champion. And I can just picture hearts pounding. I mean, wow, I'm right here where it's all happening. I've heard about this guy. And I'm really there. The Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, coming up from the armies of the Philistines, and he spoke according to the same words. So David heard them. And I, I can just imagine the fear swelling up in the chest of, of all the army there because verse 24 says, And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, when you, the army of Israel, saw the man come out of this group over there, it says they fled from him and were dreadfully afraid. I've met a few folks like that before. Now, hey, I will tell you, if, if they're coming only in the name of Jimmy or Sally or Tina and Bill, I don't blame them at all. But when you're on the front lines and you're there in the name of the Lord of hosts, You've got nothing to fear, my friend. Amen. You are a child of God. You are a child of the Most High. Amen? Amen. Amen. I will tell you for, for a fact today, if, if I'm a child of God, and I am, and if I'm in a battle, which I'm sure I'm going to be at some point, I am not going in there to lose. I am going in there to win because God is on my side. Would you give him praise today again in this place? You say, well, preacher, but what if it's your best friend? What if it's your buddy that gives up? Well, I'll help him, and I'll encourage him as best I can. But just because he quit or just because she quit doesn't mean I have to. I'm in it to win it. Amen? Amen. I am in this thing to win. I am in this thing to be victorious. Doesn't matter what's going on around here again. I will help somebody in a moment's notice, but I'm in this thing to win. And so my faith needs to stay strong, and so does yours. Amen. Turn to your neighbor and say, he's preaching at you this morning. Amen. Number six. I told you I think that I had six things, so everybody say, yeah, we're finishing up. <laughs> Number six is this. David had to deal with and David had to overcome the discouragement coming from others. You ever been discouraged? You've been discouraged. 
you know, let me just camp here for just a minute because this may speak to somebody's life or what they're going through right now. I want to back up in the story, and I want to fill out just a few blanks for just a minute. David's dad, many of you know this, David's dad was, was getting very old. And uh, David was the youngest of eight kids. We had quite a few kids there. The three oldest kids were over here fighting with the army of, of Israel. Uh, they were with King Saul there to fight. And, and David generally, though, he's going to stay back behind. He's going to stay around the house for well, all the reasons. I don't know other than him being young. But one day, David's dad, I've already read to you, his name was Jesse. He sent him out with some dried grain, Scripture would tell us. Sent, him, sent out with some bread and cheese to take to his brothers. If you read the entire story later, you're going to find that, you know, dad really wants to make sure that, that his older, older boys are okay and his sons are doing all right. But David gets there and he sees all this going on. And verse number 25 says, So the men of Israel said, talking to David, the men of Israel said to David, Have you seen this man who has come up? Surely he has come to defy Israel. And it shall be, I love this section right here, it shall be that the man who kills uh, Goliath, the man who kills him, the king will enrich with great riches. First of all, will give him his daughter, second of all, and give his father's house exemption from taxes in Israel. Now, this is just, I read this and it's just hilarious to me. First of all, I've got to think, you know, have things gotten so bad? Is everybody so scared? And does the king have so little faith in God that he's having to bribe somebody to get him to possibly go out and fight? You know, they're telling him if, if somebody kills the giant, that big guy, if somebody kills the giant, the king will make you a very, very rich man. Now that's appealing. They say if somebody kills the giant, that person's going to get to marry the king's daughter. Some would say that's very appealing too. I know a lot of men in here today that you're married. There's no way you would even open your mouth right now to say amen. But even better than that, he says, if you kill that guy, he says, you'll never have to pay taxes again. I ought to get a witness out of that today from all the adults in this place. But I can just imagine David, I think at this point, he's, he's been very, very pumped. And, and I, I think, you know, he's, he's remaining uh, real stoked about all of this. But, but, I mean, then when you throw in all the perks, it's got to be a really enticing thing. I mean, I, I get money. I get a wife. I, I mean, all this stuff, I never have to pay taxes again. When a person, think about this, church, when a person comes to Christ, and they truly encounter the grace of God, and they truly encounter the love of God and the forgiveness of sin, here's what I find. They just want to love people, and they just want to love God, serve God. Amen. They just want to see God glorified. I'm talking about when somebody really comes to, to, comes to Christ. Amen? If, if you know somebody, and you're saying, somebody that you know, they're not a Christian, they're not a believer, I will tell you for a fact, if they truly come to God, you will see that love will abound in their lives. Amen? Yeah. Amen. Are y'all with me today? Yeah. Amen. Because it just feels good to be a part of the family of God today. Would you give God praise in this place this morning? It's good to serve God. It's good to serve God. But just like with David... When you come to Christ, and we know this to be true, we're not exempt from troubles. When you come to Christ, you can count on it. Discouragement is probably going to head your way pretty quick. I can remember when I got saved. I can remember it was not long. As a matter of fact, I remember shortly after being baptized with the Holy Spirit and speaking in an unknown tongue, I remember people coming to discourage me in that. I mean, discouragement is going to come your way. But, but at this point, David's got to be feeling pretty good about all this. And then if we read the whole story, we find that David's oldest brother, though, Eliab, he basically says, he looks at him and he says, well, you little runt. I'm paraphrasing, I know. 
But he basically says, you need to go back home and you need to take care of the chores. That's really all you're good for. Who do you think you are showing up out here thinking you're so high and mighty, you little pipsqueak? People will be cruel. They really, really will. Even the king spoke to David. He said this. He said, Saul, it says, verse 33, Saul said to David, he said, you're not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him. For you are youth, and he's a man of war from his youth. You know, he's probably trying to portray this thought. You know, this guy, he kills people for kicks, for grins and giggles. You don't need to go against it. Now, I don't know, but when, you, when somebody that you respect says something to you like that, Brother Jamie, that stings a little bit, doesn't it? Has anybody ever said something to you and it just stung? I, I mean, it, it hurt. And maybe that stung a little bit when the king said that. I don't really know. But what I do know is that David made a choice and he did not let that get him down. Amen? The Bible says in verse 34 that David said to Saul, your servant used to keep his father's sheep. And when a lion or a bear came and took a lamb out of the flock, he said, I went out after it. And he said, I struck it, and I delivered the lamb from its mouth, and when it arose against me, I caught it by the beard, I struck it, and I killed it. I think David still got a little faith going on. He says, I went out after it, and struck it, and delivered the lamb from its mouth, and when it arose against me, I caught it by the beard, struck it, and killed it. Verse 36, your servant has killed both lion and bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, seeing that he has defied the army of the living God. That's faith talking right now. I will tell you, saint of God this morning, you can either walk in discouragement or you can walk in the anointing of Almighty God today. Amen? Amen. Go ahead and give God a good praise. Not just a patty cake today. People probably looked at David and they said, even while this is going on, they probably looked at David and said, he'll never do it. He'll never even go out there. And then others, they said, he'll never win. And somebody else said, he'll never succeed. He'll never overcome. But he did. But he did. There are probably people right here today, that the people watching today my live stream, that somebody has said, he'll never make it. He'll never be successful in his business. She'll never make it in what she's trying to, trying to do in life. But I will tell you as a child of God, your footsteps have been ordered and you are victorious in the name of Jesus Christ. I believe the king of glory looked down at David through the portals of heaven and he said, I predict an upset today. Mighty Goliath stands there, little David's over here, but I predict an upset victory for the kingdom of God and for God's glory. Would you give God praise today in this place? People may not have believed in David, but God did. There may be somebody in this world that doesn't believe in you, but God does. And I will tell you the true saints of God, the people of God, they believe in you also. Amen. They believe in you also. So David goes out. Here comes Goliath. Here again, he's a monster of a man. And Goliath basically says this. I'm going to paraphrase with you for a little bit for the sake of time today. Uh, Goliath basically says, I am embarrassed that they would send you out here to fight me. Go read it for yourself. Here again, I'm paraphrasing. But go, I can't believe they would send out such a weakling to fight me. But you get on over here, you little pipsqueak. I'm going to feed you to the buzzards is what I would. I'm going to feed your flesh to the buzzards. Read it in your Bible. He said, go ahead. Get on over here. Verse number 45, David said to the Philistine, you come to me with a sword, with a spear, and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defiled. I guess I've just come to tell somebody in this place today that it may not look real good right now, but I've come to tell you that I predict an upset in your life, an upset victory, amen? 
You may have goals, you may have dreams that seem unattainable, but I predict an upset. Amen. Your future may seem like it's just been set in song with negativity and all this, but I predict an upset today in your life. You say, well, I've got health issues that are holding me back. I know the God of heaven is still the healer. Amen. I predict an upset today in your life. You say, well, I, I've got an addiction that I can't seem to let go of. I can't seem to get rid of. I'm telling you, with God's help, I predict an upset in your life. Would you give God praise today in this place? And stand with me if you would this morning. Everybody stand if you would. I truly believe with all my heart that Jesus Christ has accomplished everything necessary to assure your victory in life. Everything. I mean, I don't care if you're dealing with a health problem. You may be dealing with a financial issue. I had this thought this morning, so I'm going to go ahead and speak it right now. That uh, I didn't, I mean, just came out of the blue this morning. I was putting my shoes on. I thought, I just want to believe God today for an uncommon financial blessing. I, I don't, I have no idea why I'm saying that even. But I don't think I've ever said that in my life. But whether you're dealing with a health issue, financial issue, maybe you're dealing with a, a struggle in your home, maybe you're dealing with a struggle at work, there are a lot of struggles we deal with in life. Maybe you're here today and you're dealing with a struggle on the inside because you know that things are not really right between you and God. I will tell you today that God is faithful. I will tell you today that God is able. I will tell you today that God loves you. I will tell you today unequivocally that God will make a way for you where there seems to be no way. The key is we surrender our lives to Him. Bow your heads with me if you would. With no one looking around, I, I want to ask a very serious question. It's a question that we all have to answer at some point in life. And it just so happens that God is giving us the opportunity today to answer this question. It's a personal question. It doesn't have to do with your neighbor next to you. It doesn't have to do with a parent, grandparent. It has to do with you, about your relationship with God. So I want to ask today, there's someone here, I just feel like there is, who you would say, Pastor, I need to commit my life to the Lord today. I need my sins forgiven. I need my life to be made right. I want to live life right as a child of God. I want to do right. Yes, I want to make heaven. Certainly don't want to go to hell, but more than anything else, I want to be a child of God. I want to love the Lord. Can I see your hand? Say, pray for me. I need forgiveness in my life. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. I need forgiveness. I want things right today. I want things right today before I leave this building. We're not guaranteed another breath. I guarantee you another breath. Just personally, as God is, I, I believe God is just knocking on someone's door, the heart, their heart's door today. Before we move on, is there one other one that would say, pray for me? Thank you, ma'am. Is there one more? Is there one more? Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Is there another?
here I am. I surrender. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. I see that hand. God sees that hand. back there behind you, we're going to leave it there. We're going to pick up the righteousness that's found in Christ over here. All of you that raised your hand, wants to pray in just a second. Go ahead and bow your head if you would. I want you to pray this prayer. And when you mean it, you believe it in faith, God's going to do the work. Pray this with me today. Say, Heavenly Father, Say, Heavenly Father, I come to you right now. You know my heart. You know that I need you. So, Lord, today, I ask you, because I believe in your Son, Jesus Christ, I ask you to come into my heart, to forgive my sin, to save me. And Lord, this day, I commit my life to you, and I give you praise and the wonderful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Would you give God praise today? There are quite a few folks in this room today who have committed their lives to God. I mean, you've really, you've made that choice. And first of all, I want to say congratulations. And I commend you on that today. But I want you to know also, uh, this is not the end. Walk it out in faith. Stay connected. Uh, if you haven't been baptized, I, I encourage you to be baptized. And scripture would, would share that we should. And, uh, but I am excited about your life. I really am. Church, can you give all these and everything?